Christ. Uh, before we begin our worship services, we would like to take a moment just to extend a very special welcome to everyone that is here with us this morning, and also want to extend a very special welcome to those that may be worshiping with us, worshiping with us online. Uh, we encourage everyone to worship with us at every opportunity that you have. We encourage everyone to stick around for our Bible classes this morning. They will begin at approximately 10:15 and be over promptly at 11, and then we will meet back here this evening. Uh, at 6 p.m. for our Sunday evening services, and then also we will have our midweek Bible study on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hopefully everyone is planning on being back tonight as we continue our summer series, and tonight we have with us uh, Tom Harrison. He'll be here speaking to us as we continue our summer series. If you would like to go ahead and take out your Bibles and mark the scripture reading for this morning's lesson, it'll be taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. That's 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. The of the Lord shall sound in time shall be no more, and the glory of the
Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day morning for every blessing that you've blessed each and every one of our lives with. We pray that everything we say and do in this service this morning will be in complete accordance to thy will. We ask thee now to, for special blessings upon our sick, as it's mentioned here this morning. We pray that your heathen hand will bring them back to their normal walks of life. At this time, we, we pray for our preachers, our teachers, our elders, and our deacons. We, we pray that each member of this congregation will, will follow suit and, and, and will be better Christians for it. Our Father in he heaven, we're, we're so thankful for everything that you do for us, for our jobs, our our health, our clothing, our way of life. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for our, our Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and set the example for us to get to heaven. Our Father in heaven, we're, we're so thankful for, every, for everything that you do for us, our, our families, uh, we pray a special prayer now for our country. We need a. We pray for our, our EMTs, our first responders, our doctors, our nurses. We pray that you will bring this country together, and may our leaders uh, turn to thee for for guidance. Our Father in heaven, we're we're. We ask thee now to go with us through the further walks of this service. We pray that everything that we say and do will complete accordance to thy will. For this is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The invitation song is uh, number 701. Number 701. And now let us sing number 924. I wish you'd notice very closely the lyrics of this song as we prepare to eat the Lord's Supper. I am a this time. Father, we come at this time thanking you for them all the blessings that has blessed us with, for this opportunity we have together around this table this morning. As we partake of this bread, Father, we help us to remember that it represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we partake of it in a manner well-pleasing in thy sight. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Shall we again pray? Loving and merciful Heavenly Father, we also give our thanks for the fruit of the vine that represents the precious blood of Jesus Christ, knowing that it is his blood that takes away the sins of the world. Father, help us to so live that we can look forward to his coming again. And we ask this also in Jesus' name. Amen.
reading this morning is was announced is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumult. Lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. It's good to see each of you this morning. And for you fathers, thank you for the job you have done as good fathers in your home. Thank you for leading your families here to worship this morning. And Lord willing, we're going to spend a little time talking about the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to complete our study of that book this morning, and I'm going to ask you, if you will, go ahead and get your Bibles, and we're going to turn to chapter 12. We're going to begin our reading this morning in verse 14, and we'll go through verse 19 as we prepare to study this lesson. And by the way, if you look up, the, the scripture's not going to be on the screen this morning. You're going to have to use your own Bibles. Uh, this is done on purpose. I have been told that I'm making you lazy, and uh, that may be true. So for this morning, you're going to get to use your own Bibles. If you didn't bring them with you, then look on the pew in front of you. We do have pew Bibles. Verse 14. Now this is the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours but you. For children ought not to lay up for the parents, but parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the more less that I am loved. But be that as it may, I will not be a burden to you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ. But we do all things, beloved, for your edification. What would Paul do if he was coming to see us? I want you to imagine Paul is now, he said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. This is going to be the third visit. He's already now counting this, written three letters. He came once. And then he came the second time, but when he came the second time, it wasn't very pleasant. I can tell you that many of us might would imagine that if Paul were coming, that he would pat us on the back and say, Oh, look how good you are. I don't think that's what Paul would do. I believe if Paul were coming here, Paul would look us directly in the eye and call us out on the sins that we have. You see, because sometimes we have conflicting concerns. We want the, the positive side. We don't really like the negative side. But you see, in Paul's mind, the only way that I can make you better is to point out where you're failing. And for Paul, it's a matter of preaching the word. Do you remember what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4? I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come and they will no longer endure sound doctrine. But because of their own desires, they have itching ears. They will heap to themselves teachers. And he says they will be turned aside from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 
You see, Paul would say, what's important is you preach the word, you teach the truth. But there's some serious sins remaining at Corinth. Oh yes, Paul has been very direct with them in the past. And it was not always been pleasant either. He describes his second visit with him in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He said, I determined within myself that I would not come again to you with sorrow. He said, I don't want the next visit to be confrontational, but he says it will if it's necessary. What I want you to do is I want you to prepare yourself before I get there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 21, Paul says, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in a spirit of gentleness? How do you want me to come? What do you want me to say? We're going to study chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, where Paul will confront public sin. We will study chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, where Paul will make sure it's correct in practice. And then the third thing we will study in verse 5 of chapter 13 is this continual, constant evaluation of ourselves. Am I right with the Lord? And I want us to think as we listen to Paul's teaching that we apply it to ourselves and we say, Am I learning something from this as an individual? And am I learning something from this as a congregation? So let's begin our exploration here now in verses 20 and 21. Brother Kelly read that for us for just a moment ago, but I want to focus on that again for just a minute. Paul said, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish. And I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Lest there should be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of their uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Now, the church at Corinth is not that different from practically every congregation. You have a congregation of people. Some people are doing what's right. Some people are choosing to sin. Sometimes the sinners are in the majority. Sometimes they're in the minority. But even when you have a congregation of people striving to do what is right, it appears that there are always some going to be rebellious and insubordinate and say, we're going to do what we want to do. Well, I'd suggest to you that when you read verses 20 and 21, you have a real problem here that some have not yet repented. In fact, that's what he says in verse 20 when he says those who have sinned before and have not repented. If you go back to chapter 7 and you look at verse 11, Paul is referring to the repentance by the majority of the congregation. And the reason why I use the word majority is that's the term he used back in chapter 2. Sufficient was the punishment inflicted by the majority or by the many. When you get here, you'll read about them and it says, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire. He said, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in the matter. Paul said, when I wrote you, it disturbed you. But it changed you. It made you different. And he said what happened is it caused you to repent. But not everybody did. Not everybody repented. There's two lingering problems at Corinth. The first one is a group of sins that are about strife and contentions and arguments. 
I want you to notice that what he's talking about here are some things that relate to these disagreements among members of the church. They're not unified. They're not all speaking the same thing. And someone says, what do you mean by that? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes within Christ. He said, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for you were not able to bear it. And he says, even now you're still not able to bear it. For you are still carnal where there is envy and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and are you not behaving like mere men? If you look at the church at Corinth, there's still a lot of arguments going on among them. There's different people saying, I am of Paul, I have a Cephas and I have Christ. And you know how that actually worked in problems? When I get to 1 Corinthians 5, there's a moral problem in the church. There's a person living with his father's wife. There's incest going on. He said it's so bad that not even the Gentiles will do these things. But when you get to verse 2, he says... And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. Now how in the world could a church find themselves puffed up about this, arrogant about something that bad? I can tell you how that happens. If you have strife and envy, if someone commits a sin, you ought to nail him to the wall. Get him. On the other hand, if it's someone of our family or our friends that does this, where's your mercy? Where's your kindness? Where's your compassion? You see, we feel differently depending upon who it is. And you will see that in the church here, some are puffed up rather than mourning about it. I'd ask you the question as we evaluate ourselves. Do we look at people differently in the church based upon our relationship to them? Do we find ourselves having contentions because we're not consistent in that? Well, he speaks about their contentions, their jealousies, the fact that one wants what another has. Their outbursts of wrath. Oh boy, you can see people just lose their temper in a moment. And then he says selfish ambitions where I want my way versus other people's way. And what results from that is backbitings. You bite me, I bite you back. No, we're, we're not returning good for evil. We're returning evil for evil. He says whisperings where a person gets and they talk to their friends and their neighbors and they do not tell the truth because they're trying to pit one against another. And he says what this does is ends up in tumults, just all out battle with one another. See, the problem is, is that we get to where it's all about ourselves. We tend to focus on me and we tend to focus on what I want and what my group wants. You listen to Jesus as he speaks through the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 where he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each consider or esteem others better than himself. You want a church where you don't have that kind of, of contention and strife. It's got to be where you and I start putting others ahead of ourselves. Ask yourself, would we classify ourselves based upon Scripture as those trying to do what is right in treating our neighbor? But now the second thing in verse 20, there's some sexual sins. And I know I don't like to talk about this, and I know you don't like to hear it talked about. We'd say, I don't want my little children hearing all that mess. Yes, that's right. I hear it every day on the television. And I, my guess is they see it in our families much more often than you and I want. But he talks about those who sinned before and have not yet repented of their uncleanness, their fornication, and their lewdness. You see, in their eyes, 
We can live like the world. Does our dress reflect the, the dress of the world? Does our behavior reflect the same kind of behavior that the world? You see, if you go back and you put yourself in first century Corinth, this is a very pagan city. There are prostitutes walking the streets, and there are many people think it's a religious thing to participate in that. And some who have been converted out of it may want to go back and revert to their previous behavior. You know what Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18? He said, flee fornication. Every sin that man does is outside of the body, but he who commits fornication sins against his own body. And he goes on to say that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He said your body and your spirit belong to God. You see in the church at Corinth they're not only fussing and fighting they're also committing fornication and all the things that are related to it. The truth is you can't Commit fornication and be pleasing to God. And you can't fuss and fight in the Lord's church and be pleasing to God. But now let's go to chapter 13. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. This is the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek the proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you but mighty in you? Now here's something important. Paul says we're going to correctly determine the truth. We're not going to go on rumor. We're not going to go in in, on innuendo. We're not going to say, well, I heard someone say this. Discipline that Paul is anticipating here is too serious to not be handled correctly. You see, there is a biblical standard that is presented in Scripture. And the biblical standard is this. You don't just accept one man's word. You have to have two or at least three or two, at least two, but maybe three to establish the truth of something. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15 and Moses writes, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every the matter shall be established. By two or three witnesses. One man can't rise up against another man. You know why that's a good point? It's because if you have a church like Corinth where there's a lot of contentions, there'll be a lot of people say, you know what I heard about Brother Paul? Brother Paul did this. Brother Paul said that. You may have an axe to grind with him. No, no, that's not going to work. You've got to have the, the witnesses to prove the matter. Now, what if you do? What if you have the proof? Paul said, I will not spare. You don't pull back. You don't hold back because a person is of prominence. Or because a person is your friend, you have some good relationship with him. He said, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established and those of sin. So I foretell you, when I get there, I'm not going to spare them. See, discipline in order to be carried out properly has to be carried about according to the truth. And if I read scripture carefully, I realize there's some aspects of it that are very important. Number one, I always establish the truth. But second of all, I have to have care that the right attitudes are involved. You know what the scripture tells us? Galatians chapter 6, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. 
meekness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. I have to go with a, a meek, kind, humble attitude, realizing that I myself am vulnerable to sin. Second of all, I've got to recognize that when I'm doing this, it's not to get rid of the person, it's to try to save their soul. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it's very obvious there that he said you don't count him as an enemy, but you admonish him as a brother. You love that person. You love them enough to want to save their soul. And if a person studies 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you see that was exactly the goal and that was exactly what was accomplished and it turned out well for the church. We've got to be correct in our practice. In writing to the seven churches, he says about Jezebel, I gave her space of time to repent. When I read Paul's letter to Titus, he said, he said a factious man after a first and second admonition reject. In other words, you don't immediately get rid of somebody. You try to go to them repeatedly. Because you want to save their souls. Paul's trying to write the church in advance to say to them, Good brethren, I want to save this church, and we're going to do it right. We're going to do it correctly. Now look with me at verse 5. This is the third part of our lesson here. He said, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Now, Paul is saying here to examine yourselves, to test yourselves. Am I in the faith? Am I in Jesus Christ or is Jesus Christ in me? Now, I know one of the things that most of us would say is, how do I do that? I mean, in, in a practical way, what is Paul asking me to do? What he's asking me to do is to make sure that what I read in Scripture is what I'm doing. One of the passages that I've often used is Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. The passage has often been misused. He said, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I've talked to people in denominational churches who would say, oh, I'm not worried about my salvation. I feel it right here. The Holy Spirit's already told me that. And they say, you know, that passage in Romans 8 where he says, his spirit bears witness to our spirit that we're children of God. And I say, that's not what it says. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. There's a big difference between to and with. If you say his spirit bears witness to my spirit, that's the Holy Spirit telling me I'm all right. He doesn't do that. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. He provides the words, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. He said holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's where that message comes from. With our spirit, that takes me saying, okay, what's the Holy Spirit said? What have I done? Am I in the faith or not? Is, am I living the life that God wants me to live or not? Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. Let's begin with verse 18. Very practical portion of John's letter my little children let us not love in word or in tongue but in deed and in truth and by this we know that we are of the truth and our hearts or shall assure our hearts before him for if our heart condemns us God is greater than our heart and knows all things Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence with God. I could go on reading, but I think you get the idea of this point. It's not just about what I say, but it's doing something too. 
You know, I can say, Lord, Lord, but Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Oh, uh -huh, there's a difference there. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. You can look at someone who's suffering and you can say, oh, I love you. I wish this for you. Be warmed and filled and not give them what is needful for the body. And James says, what does it profit? Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know what you've done. But then he goes on to talk about our hearts. Assuring. You know how my heart can feel good if God tells me to do something and I do it? God tells me to do something and I don't do it, then I have a condemning conscience. Or God tells me don't do something and I do it, then I have a condemning conscience. But he says... If our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence toward God. I'm going to read verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him oh now I understand examine yourselves test yourselves whether Christ is in you okay I think I'm starting to understand when I keep his commandments Jesus Christ must be in us you know today's Father's Day Several of us have already put photos of our fathers on our Facebook page to say, here's my father. I'm thankful and blessed to have been raised by a good father. Quite frequently, people will say, you know what? You look like your daddy. Do we look like our heavenly father in our actions? Does Jesus live in us to the point where people can look at us and say, I see Jesus in him. Romans 8 and verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Christ is in you, you ought to be able to see a person living a righteous life. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The only way we're going to, able, to be able to please God is if we're doing what is right. Paul said, unless indeed you are disqualified. Why don't you think about that phrase? Unless indeed you're disqualified. There's a number of people who participate in sports. And when you get to the end, you find out they cheated. Maybe, for instance, there was a limitation on the, the number of pounds of air that could be in a football. Or maybe there's a limitation on the size of a motor in a car. Or maybe there, there's a limitation or rules about how you run a race. In other words, you can't take the shortcut. You've got to do it right. And sometimes a person comes to the end and says, oh, they won. But then you say, oh, no, no, they didn't. They're disqualified because they cheated. They didn't do it right. Do you want to get to the day of judgment and not stand before the Apostle Paul but stand before our Lord Jesus Christ and him look at you and say, Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. I don't want to be disqualified. Well, if I don't, I've got to do this constant evaluating of myself. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith Test yourselves. That's an obligation.
Paul is ready to come the third time. And as he prepares to come, he's telling the brethren at Corinth, I really love you. He started out, he said, you know, the parents don't lay, the children don't lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He said, I am willing to spend and be spent for you. I'm willing to do whatever it takes because my rebuke, my message of discipline is not because I don't love you. It's because I do love you and I want to see you change. This morning, a lot of you sitting here are right with the Lord. What you need to do is keep on doing what's right. Some of us here are not Christians. And if you think about the ultimate outcome of that is you're lost. You don't get to go to heaven when this life is over. In fact, what you have done is made yourself reservations with the devil and torment. But it's not as if anybody is relishing in that idea but the devil. Jesus doesn't love that idea. We don't love that idea. You can come forward this morning just like the Ethiopian eunuch and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Here's water. I want to be baptized. We'll assist you in doing that. And according to Scripture, your sins will be washed away. Some of us here are nursing sin in our lives. And we've let it go on. And now we're to the point where we're embarrassed by it. But you can still take care of it this morning. It's a very serious thing of what we're about to do. We're going to sing the invitation song. And it's not just you're going to repeat some words to a, a tune or a hymn. This is a message to call to repentance. We're going to sing tomorrow may be too late. If you need to come, would you come as we stand and sing?
everyone here. Again, we say welcome, especially if you might be visiting with us. We want you to know that we appreciate your wanting to serve God and to worship him this morning and to be with us, and we invite you to come back whenever you can. And we'll have Bible class. We'll start here in the auditorium in just a few minutes. And then we'll have our evening service again at 6 p.m. this evening. And I'd like to encourage everyone to remember all the sick and the shut-ins in your prayers and let them know that you're thinking about them and that you, that you love them. And to uh, check the bulletin for all the youth activities and events that are going on. And remember that the Ice Cream Fellowship is Wednesday, July the 1st. We're going to be eating ice cream, and I know, I believe I can eat a cup of ice cream and stay six feet away from you, Leonard, so... I believe that can be done, so let's all look forward to doing that. And our virtual VBS will be available on Facebook and YouTube July the 13th through the 15th, so those of us that are working on that, we need to get busy and get this done. So I'm talking to myself also. So thank you once again, and now Brother Leonard. Must I go and to assemble here today to study thy word, sing songs to thy praise, partake of the Lord's Supper, and give of our means, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this congregation here, and we ask you to bless our sick, forgive us of our many sins, in Christ's name, amen. <laughs> 